Okay, we are live. <laughs> um, so, hi, Becky. How is it going? <laughs> My Canadian accent comes hi, out. Jessica. We've done it. We've, we've done live. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, I actually don't know if it's working. Um, so, I'm really sorry about that. Also, because... That's okay. Okay, so someone is in the watching right now. Can you please let us know if the audio is working? Is the audio working? <laughs> Technology is complicated. <laughs> I'm sure. I think you guys can hear Becky and my. It says that my audio is working, but I just want to make sure it's working. Yes. Okay. They can hear me. Okay. Everyone can hear me. Okay. Now we, we can start yeah. officially. So. My mom still doesn't know how to attach files to email. So I think we're a step back. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, Becky. Thank you so much for being patient with me. How are you? My pleasure. I'm doing great. And friends over the internet is my favorite. How are okay. you? <laughs> I'm very well. A little stressed out. Um, everyone says they can hear both of us. Um, I don't know if everyone knew, but we were actually supposed to start an hour ago. And because of, you know, time differences and Google lied to us about the time difference, <laughs> um, we're starting an hour late. And also, I forgot to plug in my mic. So it took me like 20 minutes to figure out why the mic wasn't working. Anyway, now back to Becky. <laughs> We're here. So Becky is doing her master's currently in Mexico, <laughs> and she's doing it in wildlife conservation. And specifically, she's doing, you said it's um, forest fires and butterflies. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. cool. So can you sort of take us back to before you did your master's, before you moved abroad, um, Mm -hmm. When did you really decide you wanted to study? Um, I mean, actually, it wasn't even wildlife conservation that you studied in your bachelor's, right? Was it more of a general science or what was that? And why did you choose to study that? Yeah, so, I mean, since I was really young, I loved animals. And I just didn't really know how to translate that, like, in, into science. Um, so in high school, I was really interested in, like, biology and all that kind of stuff. And in my university, it's a very small university, so I actually just took a general biology degree, and it actually focused a lot on microbiology and animal physiology, okay. and I took a very small amount of actual, like, ecology and, like, conservation mm -hmm. content. Um, but kind of despite that, I always knew that that was what I wanted to do, even though everyone around me was studying medicine and agriculture and different kinds of things. So um, I actually started going abroad from my second year of my undergrad. So I've actually been doing that for about six years now. So that happened quickly. <laughs> wow. So where did you go abroad in your second year? Um, it was my first conservation trip. I went to northeastern Peru to the Amazon rainforest, and I was there for a month. I was just as like a research assistant, but it was kind of like my first experience with um, tropical biodiversity monitoring, really. And yeah, from then I just kept going. So was that sort of like the first moment or was that something that built off of like your love for um, animals in the environment? Or was that sort of the first moment when you were like, OK, yeah, I'm moving to Central or South America and I'm going to do this? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a mixture. Like I knew that I wanted to work in the forest doing something conservation related and I knew that pretty much since forever like as long as I could remember mm -hmm. I didn't like the first time I saw the ocean I was like 16 so I was never like as a young kid like I want to work in the ocean or I want to like no I all I knew was forest and prairie and that's what I wanted to do so when I went to Peru the first time that was actually the second time of five times I've been to Peru oh wow um yeah so that that trip actually kind of turned me off like I actually didn't want to do conservation after I took that trip it was really hard like we were in the field we were completely subject to weather the food was really difficult to like get used to because we were in such mm -hmm. a remote place it was uncomfortable like there were so many mosquitoes like it was really difficult and so actually after that first trip I was a bit like I don't know if I want to do like that specifically yeah um Actually, that's turned out to be exactly what I have done. I've kind of just gotten over the difficulties. But that was the first moment when I was like, 
definitely like Latin America, um, there's a lot of opportunities there. And that was when I first started to study Spanish. So that was exactly like the six year mark of starting to study Spanish. So was that, so now when you're studying in Mexico, is everything in Spanish? Yep. (laughs) Wow. That's crazy. And it's not like math or something that is easily translated. It's actually like, no, you have to understand what they're saying. Yeah, it's actually, so technically my degree, so I work in conservation and I work with butterflies and forest fires, but actually technically the degree is forestry, like forest, like wood extraction and stuff like that. So actually a lot of the courses are very mathematical about like tree volumes and like, um, like lifespans and like how to generate seeds and like greenhouses and stuff like that, which is really interesting but I have no experience in it like whatsoever. And it's all in Spanish. And they put up these graphs with like five axes and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, I get through <laughs> and yeah, life lessons. <laughs> so, so then um, when like with all of the knowledge that you're gonna gain, do you want to apply it to where you are now? Like, do you wanna stay in Mexico or do you wanna go back to Peru? Or do you wanna take all of this, like the knowledge and the experience you're gaining and do you wanna take it back to Canada? It's a complicated question because like, I'm really connected to the work that I'm doing in Mexico. I'm also really connected to another project that I do every summer in Honduras, which I've done for four summers now in terms of like the community advancement and like the community aspects of conservation but i have a personal conflict with it because as an outsider as a canadian i don't feel that it's my place to go to another country and say like this is what you need to do to conserve your forest because i don't know anything about like the struggles that they're facing or what needs they need to be met or what is working just fine for them like as for me as like a foreign man master student that's not my place to go anywhere and say this is what you have to do mm-hmm. so for that reason I am interested in continuing and being involved in those projects that can be useful and not infringe upon people's like personal lives um, but I am interested in going back to Canada definitely and I would like to work for Parks Canada actually it's one of my like dream dream goals oh yeah. nice so back in Alberta or travel like anywhere in Canada okay yeah cool. I've been in Alberta my whole life I was born in Saskatchewan actually so really like I've never even been to eastern Canada so I would totally be open to anything <laughs> anywhere it's even there's lots of cool stuff to do in the north as well yeah I've always wanted to go to the north I really want to go uh see the northern lights up there um and uh, what else is there going to be up there there's going to be some sort oh there's going to be a total uh, lunar eclipse in like three years, but only over over the n- really? northern part of Canada. So I think that's really cool. Um, that yeah, no, but I totally get what you what you mean about like going to another country and telling them this is what you should be doing. Um, mm-hmm. Because I often think about that when you know, like in developed countries we like went through our own industrial revolution and we polluted the crap out Mm -hmm. of everything and burnt so much coal and whatever and then other countries that are developing and want to get to the same developed state or whatever um Mm -hmm. like they need to go through their same um sort of revolution in order to advance their technology And then who are we to say, no, you can't do that because it's polluting. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, we all know now that, okay, this is going to, this is really bad. It's causing a lot of pollution. But at the same time, who are we to be like, no, we can do it, but you can't make the same mistakes we did. Um, Yeah. And and especially, like, especially in this project that I work on in Honduras, like, there's a lot of issues and a lot of things that people hear about Honduras, like it definitely has a worse reputation than what is actually happening. But at the same time, like there are a lot of like, there's government corruption, a lot of human rights issues. Like conservation is like the bottom of their priority list. And for good reason, because like, if you can't feed your family, like obviously you don't care what happens to like the trees if they're getting cut down. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that, like a lot of that has been actually brought on by the United States and their involvement in in Central America and there's like so much documented evidence for this and so when I kind of see that process of events and I look at the state of conservation I think like I really feel that 
people in other countries would be better off without us. Like, yeah. if we kind of just, like, stop. And, like, if people are looking for resources and if they're looking for foreign investment, okay, that's a different situation. But, like, yeah, for us to just go and be like, well, we're going to put in an eco-lodge to make a bunch of money off it and send all the money abroad and you guys should stop cutting your forest down because we want to make money off of tourists. Like, it's so hypocritical. It doesn't work. It's not good conservation. So it's kind of, like, complicated in terms of the politics of it. Yeah. Uh, can you explain for someone that wouldn't know um, what you mean by what's happening in Honduras? Yeah, so based on like what I know and the research that I've done um, in Central America so it's particularly in Guatemala but also in Honduras and in Nicaragua like the United States basically got involved in the civil war like exacerbated civil wars there was a civil war in Guatemala in the 1980s um, and they based troops out of Honduras in order to participate in these conflicts in Guatemala and Nicaragua mm -hmm. and basically they it was kind of like a cold war type mentality where they were like well we don't want other superpowers to come up with a communist way of thinking. Um, and there were other factors as well. They were harvesting bananas and like that kind of stuff. So, and that has continued in Honduras specifically up until 2009. There was a coup d'etat against the sitting prime minister, Manuel Zelaya. And the United States, like, it kind of like got involved in that situation. The details are not super clear to me, but. Um, Honduras was like kicked out of the organization of American states and like there was this whole thing and that was in 2009 and things have like gone downhill politically in Honduras since then so it's like direct um, I think it was the like, Hillary Clinton and like the Clinton like kind of um, way of thinking that was like well you know maybe we need to like keep this from happening in Honduras or maybe we need to butt out and make sure that they let their corrupt presidents get elected and a lot of like details and, and policies like that that have started like since the 1950s like a long time ago and are continuing today so but the outcome of these sort of like political disputes is um like not you're saying that a direct outcome of these disputes is like not conserving the environment or not directly i think like a lot of the issues that are going on in Central America have to do with the United States involvement politically in the past and also due to drug policy. I don't think that they're direct, directly related, but I think that the capacity for governments to focus on conservation is limited because they're mm -hmm. focusing on other things. And I also think because of the amount of corruption that is in these governments, it's the capacity for citizens to focus on conservation is also limited because they don't feel confident with their political process and in a lot of cases they might not necessarily have the resources in order to be able to focus on conservation even from an individual level like if people are worried about organized crime if people are worried about poverty if people are worried about government corruption they won't be able to focus on conservation so okay. i don't think they're directly related like to say it in that way but um but yeah it has an influence okay so Right now you're doing your master's and you're taking classes, but you're also doing a thesis? Okay, and yes. so your thesis has to do with forest conservation and is that where Honduras has to come in? Where Honduras comes into play or? It's totally unrelated. Oh, oh okay, okay. I thought, <laughs> I thought that's where the link to Honduras comes from. Okay, so then your forest... Con no. Okay, so your forest conservation research then, is that on a forest in Mexico or how are you going about that? Okay. And then where do so butter... I'm, oh. It's, it's called, um, in English, it's called uh, the Peaks of Monterey National Park. So Monterey is a big city in northeastern Mexico. Um, and it's basically like in the middle of a big mountain range. So it's like, uh, yeah, there's mountains all around it, forests, all kinds of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where there was a forest fire two years ago or like a year and a half ago. And that's where I'm studying the changes in the butterfly communities. Okay. So that's where the butterflies come in. Yeah. So that's kind of like, I'm like thinking a lot about Honduras cause I was just there like three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I just got back. Okay. Um, so like kind of like similar similar like issues and I do similar work in both areas okay um and I feel similarly about both projects but in terms of the actual data collection they're separate projects okay so then how is monitoring butterfly communities um helpful like how do you extract data from I mean I'm what I'm curious about is like 
how are you extracting that data from butterfly communities? And then how is that data translating into like something useful? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me to actually get the data, like it's just field trips. Um, there's loads of different like methods that you can use for measuring all kinds of different animals. So for butterflies are really easy. Like they're easy to see, they're easy to find, they're abundant and they're easy to catch. They don't bite, they don't hurt you. Like they're uh -huh. super, super easy. So I can, I can literally just pick my field site, walk around and count and catch the butterflies, identify them. And that's like literally it. Um, I also have like traps, butterflies come in, they like rotten bananas, beer, uh, Gatorade, pee. They like all kinds of rotten fish. They like weird stuff. So you can put that in like a bottle, bottom of a trap. It's like a big tube made of like net basically. Mm -hmm. And they're really easy to catch. I literally just like sewed it in my apartment, like really <laughs> straightforward. So collecting all of those data basically to just find out like how many butterflies, how many species, what's the species even is like, all those kinds of things. Um, and then that information, hopefully, this is where politics comes into play as well again, um, that information would be um, available to government officials, would be taken into account when governments write their policies and um, kind of make write their reports about the progress and the status of conservation and that kind of thing. Um, in Canada, generally that information is well received it's available. Policymakers take it into account if it's if it's a, a high scale project and something that's that's um, of good quality. I think in other countries that's not necessarily the case. So despite the fact that research is available, it, it may not be taken into account because governments want to seem like they're being more progressive than they actually are, or want to act like there's not um, conservation issues. Or for example, in the national park where I work, it's right around a major city, so. People want the park to be smaller so that they can sell the land because it's really profitable. It's a really nice land to sell real estate. So all kinds of conflicting interests, which makes the political aspect complicated. But the idea is it for into to inform conservation policies. Okay, but okay, so, but gathering information about I just want to like understand, and then so also other people that are yeah. watching can understand. So gathering yeah. information about the butterflies and about the different species, and I guess the like the number that you find and over a period of time, yeah. um, that informs policies by being like, listen, this is how many we have and these are the different species and they're only like different information like that like they're only available in this part of Mexico or in this part of Canada and yeah. stuff like that so that whole aspect is like a bit complicated and I'm still not exactly sure what the data are going to look like and what the results will mean but it does depend on what the species actually are so if there's three common species of butterflies that are generalist species, they can live anywhere, they can drink nectar from whatever flower, they can mm -hmm. eat whatever, then you're going to find them anywhere regardless if there's been a forest fire or if there's been another kind of disturbance that won't necessarily affect them. So it does depend on how abundant more specialist species are. So maybe one butterfly only drinks from two or three species of flowers. Mm -hmm. That butterfly is going to be a lot more affected by a disturbance like a forest fire. Um, and those are the species that I need to pay attention to in my results. Um, with that being said, I don't know exactly which species those are yet. I'm collecting data on that as well. Um, but that's kind of the like blurry bit that will hopefully become clearer at okay. the end of Okay, that's really cool though. I like how you can sew the net in your <laughs> apartment. Now I think that's what I'm going to do on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think yeah, I would love like, to catch a butterfly. Recyclable materials and everything. It's, it's really easy. Like anyone could do it. <laughs> yeah, you should make like a tutorial or something. Yeah, maybe I will. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to know in terms of like getting into this field, into wildlife conservation, like you took this one very specific path and I'm assuming it's only one of many different paths that you can take. Like you went into microbiology. Um, wait, is that what it is? Yeah, microbiology. <laughs> and what other sort of paths would someone in their bachelor's take if they wanna end up doing what you are doing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there, like anything biology related can be applied to conservation. 
there's a really big field of like population genetics, which is quite focused on microbiology, um, mm. which is a huge part of conservation. So there is absolutely that facet. But I remember like specifically in my mind the first time, well, the first time that I went to the field in Peru in the Amazon, I remember a professor, I was talking to him and we were just talking about conservation and he was trying to like bestow his wisdom on my young 19 year old brain. Uh. And I remember he told me, if you, if you care about wildlife conservation and if you care about the environment, you will become a politician. And at the time I was a bit like, I get where you draw the link, but I kind of kind of feel like no like if if you want to be in, involved in the environment you should be in the environment and doing science and everything but like from all of these long-winded like histories of Central America that I've just told you like I can see now where that comes into play so that's another kind of area that I would recommend of someone who has a specialization in conservation maybe he's done field work he's done lab work maybe he's done education like whatever the field you may end up in I do believe that, like, the actual change does occur at the policy level and at the government level. So that's another, like, future interest of mine, potentially. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, because I was thinking, um, like, in terms of plastic use, because I don't know if you see, see like, sometimes I post about, um, like, my zero waste initiatives or whatever on Instagram, but... Yeah. Um, like, I always think it's so difficult. Like, some of my friends are like, how do I... It's just so easy for me to go to this restaurant and, like, get a takeaway container. And, I, like, I'm not going to carry around a container with myself, like, in case I... You know, in case, like, all of these different things happen and I just happen to be in the yeah. situation where I, I need a takeout container. And, it like, really, it's only going to come from policy. Like, from policy changes. Like... I can do what I yeah. want and I can try to bring as many containers as I want and try to not buy anything in plastic. But in the end, like yeah. all big change is just going to come from policy. Um, so in that sense, I, I, uh -huh. yeah. I was going to say, I just recently read the essay, the tragedy of the commons. It was written in like 1968. It was published in science and it, the author makes that specific argument, talks about, like, the issues of, like, the common re shared resource losses in terms of environmental degradation and all that stuff. And he makes a specific argument, like, if you appeal to people on an individual level, like, don't, don't contaminate it or whatever, some people are going to pay attention and some people will learn and a lot of other people will not. And that's just, like, a human nature kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I really... And he makes the exact same argument in the paper, like, it won't be as efficient as, as governmental regulations at the end of the day, which yeah. I agree with. Yeah, of course, yeah. And I was going to say something else, but I completely <laughs> lost my train of thought. But I, I also told you that this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but uh, oh, dang it, I forgot. But no, we were talking, talking about takeaway containers. Yeah, and it's policy fun. changes. Will oh yeah, no, no, no. So inclusion. like your like your teacher was saying that um, yeah, maybe a, a potential future job for you would be to like be in government or be in policy because he said if you if you care about the environment, then that's where. Um, maybe your career will lead but it's also really cool to see that recently a lot like more scientists I feel like scientists are being taken more seriously recently for some reason and maybe it is because of yeah maybe it is because of like all of <laughs> the science communication that um or maybe it's because I'm just new to this environment so I'm seeing it all now <laughs> um yeah. but I also see in the news that for example a lot more um I don't know people in like higher government positions are be that are being elected have scientific backgrounds and i think that's really interesting and i think through these types of like recognitions we will take into account or at least i hope we'll take into account um the opinions of more scientists like at least for um like these bigger long-term solutions or long-term policies yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was that famous. Yeah, famous what? Sorry. I was gonna say the. I was gonna say about that famous graphic that came out in 2015 when Trudeau was elected of his whole cabinet and how like the Minister of Transportation is an astronaut and the Minister of like I don't know immigration was an immigrant and the 
government, like, and how everyone's, like, job actually corresponded to what they're the minister of. I, I hope that that does have, like, a positive effect on society. People who actually have the experience in what they're supposed to be an expert in will be able to make policies that are actually relevant and, and useful. Yeah, why? Okay, I haven't seen that, so you're going to have to send it to me, and then <laughs> maybe I can yeah, link it in the hopefully. description below. Yeah. Yeah. So another question I had was if, um, like, someone wanted to get into wildlife conservation, what would be your number one um, advice to someone? Like, if you, if you had one thing to tell someone that wanted to go into wildlife conservation and that was super passionate about the environment, just like you, what would be your number one piece of advice to young Becky, let's say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, young Becky. <laughs> I think... I mean, I think the political aspect is a big one. Like, you have to know going into it, it's inescapable, and you have to come with a, an interest or open-minded enough to develop an interest in it because it's unavoidable. Um, and also, I think conservation is a lot more broad than people think it is. Mm -hmm. Like, all, there are all kinds of nonprofit organizations and, and um, even just, like, education programs and stuff like that that all work in favor of environmental conservation. Like, I even just learned a lot about it in high school. Mm -hmm. So I think people underestimate the role of other types of professions that play a huge role in conservation. So it's not necessarily just, like, bushwhacking through the Amazon and, like, finding animals, which I turned out to be terrible at. <laughs> um, yeah, at the first try wasn't, wasn't very good. Um, yeah, I think that would be the main thing. Like I said, there's lots of different ways. And even what I said about like microbiology being like a huge, like its own field of conservation biology and population genetics, like it is more than just the forest. It's, it's a lot of different things. Okay. So basically, so that people, um, understand that like wildlife conservation just has such a broad reach and that, yeah, it, I like the idea that like there's a room for anything that's like I feel like there's room for everyone in wildlife conservation I mean even for yeah. my friends that are in um doing really like energy or working in fuel cells like that could be yeah. pushed down to I mean having an environment a positive environmental impact hopefully uh absolutely yeah I think yeah, I always have, like, oh sorry yeah. No, you go ahead. I keep no, you. no, no, no. I was going to say, I always, like, feel like if I wasn't directly in mechanical engineering, I would be in wildlife conservation, but I would specifically be in, uh, like, ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm glad that other people would, because I'm terrified of the ocean, so. Really? But I know this is there. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so many, like, the currents and the waves and the, all the, uh, scared me. Um, no, I was going to say, um, like, so we have the, like, the oil sands in Alberta, and, like, that is, like, very, like, there's so many, like, environmental engineering, like, projects and opportunities there, and that has, like, super direct effects, because wildlife conservation, like, focuses on the life part of it, but the entire habitat, like, the climate, everything is a factor of that, and habitat loss is generally, can, like, agreed to be the major driver of like mm -hmm. species extinction and habitat and habitat degradation, habitat loss. So yeah, anything that has to do with habitat, if you're talking about like, for example, one of my like secondary careers would have been city planning. Like I think city design is a huge part of, of environmental conservation because the way that we are able to move ourselves in the city affects our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if we're able to move in a bicycle, that's way better. Um, the amount of space, the way that our lawn, like our yards and our public parks, like our, all, all of that is very related to conservation. So yeah, in another life, I would have been a city planner or some kind of engineer as well. There's so many engineering projects and innovations that go into conservation. Yeah. And now I'm just like, now I'm like, based off of what you're saying, I'm just thinking like, yeah, you know, I feel like we would have yeah. saved <laughs> if we had air conditioning in our building, which we don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could have saved because our building is so hot and generally when you have to cool down these buildings I mean you have to use so much energy but there are buildings that are cool yeah. naturally um, because of the way that they've yeah. been engineered um, and so Absolutely. I think that's really cool yeah or even yeah. like our super Com conservation. Yeah. <laughs> or even our super computing 
Wait, what? Sorry. We need more engineers uh. to help <laughs> solving these problems. <laughs> I was also thinking, like, even our supercomputer center is built under a lake so that it can cool the computers naturally instead of putting them in, like, a freezer. Oh yeah. So I that's think that's really cool, cool too. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to know, what is the best advice you've ever gotten? This is, yeah, I know. It's just, like, ever. laying it out there. <laughs> is there something that you um, always mm -hmm. stick to? You're always, like, reminding yourself... <laughs> Um, something that I'm always reminding myself um, I get a lot of advice from the internet lately uh, okay. I find memes very inspiring Okay. Um, but I think like one thing that I've really like been reminding myself a lot in the past year so I've just started like being active on social media since I got to Mexico one year ago and I'm always being asked and asking myself, like, what, what do I actually care about? Like, mm -hmm. and, and it, it goes for kind of like prioritizing as well, like in your day-to-day -day stuff, like what is actually the most important thing and what, what is going to advance you to where you want to be kind of thing. But also just like when I'm communicating with people, like I tend to get lost in my thoughts and my speech and not be very concise sometimes as well. So Same. like able to like, take a step back and be like, what is it that I want to share? Like, what do I want people to take away? And what do I want to take away from other people as well? When I'm listening, what do I value? And what questions do I want to ask to find out the things that have value to me and the things that I genuinely care about? Mm -hmm. So, and it's hard when you sit down and be like, who am I as a person? Like, what, what's important to me? It's like a really hard question to answer, so. It's, it's a process. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think being self-aware and mindful is one of the most important and also useful skills that someone can have. Like, understanding yeah. why am I feeling this way? Why do I think this way? What do I want my, like, action? Like, why am I doing this thing? And what should I be doing? Like, asking all these questions take yeah. time. But I really think being self-aware is really... It should be the number one skill that... I mean, personally, I think if I'm an employer, I would yeah. just be, like, looking to see if whoever I'm hiring is self-aware and um, yeah. mindful of their actions and stuff like that. And it, it makes your life and your time so much more efficient because when you know absolutely, like, what your motivations are for doing something and when you can explain it, then you know that you are doing the right thing. And even just, like, in terms of, like, organizing your time, like, that happens to me so often where I say yes to a million things and I have a big list and I'm like what do I actually care about and what can I actually contribute to in a positive way and what am I just do doing because I feel like obligated to or or whatever so yeah it makes your time more efficient you're better to organize yeah no exactly I agree um and then stepping back a little <laughs> I forgot to ask this question <laughs> earlier but I wanted to know I mean so you're living abroad I'm living abroad um, I'm yes. sure we both have different reasons for living abroad. However, why did you choose, I mean, what motivated you to move away from home to a completely different country? You said that everything is in Spanish and you've been learning Spanish for six years. Um, probably helped that you started learning Spanish, but still <laughs> living in a completely different country <laughs> where, the la mm -hmm. the, where uh, uh, the language is not your native language. Mm -hmm. um, what motivated you to do that? And also, um, like, how did you get over the fear, if you had any, to move there? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, a, I always wanted to leave because I lived with my parents during my, the whole five years of my undergrad. And, I mean, I'm from Lethbridge, which is not, like... Toronto and Vancouver where there's like lots of opportunities and different places to go and like it's it's beautiful and there are lots of good things there but I didn't feel like where I was living there was a lot for me to advance to at mm -hmm. the time um and maybe there will be when I go back but at the time it wasn't what I wanted <clears throat> um I spent a lot of time abroad I had already spent so I've already had four summers in Honduras and I've done two seasons as well in Peru 
I did one in Vancouver and I did other projects in, in Honduras as well. So I had actually already been away for two years before I started my master's. Um, and I, I mean, you know, they always say whatever you're afraid of, it means the more that you're afraid of doing something, it means you should do it. And, you know, fear is a good indication of that you're doing the right thing. So I kind of just use that. Um, <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that, but the fact really? that you, you, like, that's what you, has driven your life decisions, like something, yeah, <laughs> I like, like it. Yeah, like, when you're presented with a choice, and you're afraid of one of the choices, or different types or levels of fear, that, like, it means that it's important, and, and a good path for you, I guess, so I, I was nervous before I came to Mexico, but I definitely use that to orient myself. And I mean, to be honest, like I already have, I already lived in Mexico previously as well before I came to do my master's. So honestly, it wasn't that hard. Like I have a lot of friends and family like around this area. Um, and I am actually fully fluent in Spanish. So like it hasn't been that big of an adjustment. Like to come to Monterey, I had already been to Monterey a few times before. I know where all my friends live. Like, I don't know. It was kind of like the cushiest um, moving abroad process that I could have had. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm sure there are other places where probably maybe it would have been more difficult to move, but I still think it's a big step. It's still, yeah, yeah, a whole country between you and, and Mexico. <laughs> but was, I mean, I eased into it for sure, because I had been to Mexico a couple of times previously. I have, like I said, I know people in most major Mexican cities and have like close friends and had been to Latin America and already knew the language. So mm -hmm. I kind of like worked my way into it instead of kind of just jumping in all at once. Yeah. T yeah. That's probably a lot better than what I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you, you have a big culture shock? <laughs> yeah, I, I really did. And I did not speak the language and I just wanted to cry when I first moved here, <laughs> but it's a lot better now. I swear. <laughs> no, but what I was going to say was the way that you said <laughs> that you approach all of your, um, like all of the choices, like you're like, oh, if it's scary, then I'm probably doing something right. Um, I guess that's exactly how I make all of my decisions. I just word it differently. So whenever people ask me like, oh, should I do this or should I do this? For, like, obviously it's different for everyone what they should be doing. But what I always tell people is I always make my decisions based on the thing that's the, scary, the scariest slash the thing with the most uncertainty. So... Yeah. I could have stayed in Canada, but I could sort of see my future. I was like, yeah, like, I'm probably just going to end up doing this. Like, I could see my future, and that's really stable, and that's really comforting. And for yeah. some people, that's enough. You know, for me, it wasn't. I was like, I think I would just rather, like, move to Switzerland and just see what happens. <laughs> like... I have no, yeah. yeah, I have no idea what would happen when I moved here. You know, like I could, I could have stayed in Montreal. Yeah. I could have had my life figured out. And instead I was like, nope, I'm just going to throw that all to the wind, move to Switzerland and figure it out. And for me, I mean, these types of situations breed the most opportunity because you don't know what's going to happen. Whereas in Montreal I was like, yeah, I, I pretty much know what's going to happen. So that's the way I look at it. But I think it's pretty much the same thing yeah. that you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. Um, I know you have class soon, so I want to make sure that you have enough time to get to class. But thank you so much oh, to thank everyone. You. Thank you so much for listening. Um, everyone says hello. Yes. Cesar Martinez says hello from Mexico. So there are a lot Bye, of people so here. <laughs> um, but now we have to tell them all goodbye. So <laughs> we'll speak later on Instagram and other kinds of medium media. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, you can see in the banner below where you can find Becky on Twitter and on Instagram. She posts all about her um, butterfly encounters and her research on Instagram and her life in Mexico. So be sure to follow her there if you want to see more from her. And once again, thank you so much. And thank you for being patient with me while I figured out all the technical <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And best of luck with the rest of your live streams. And I look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure we will speak again soon. I love talking about the environment. It's like my favorite thing to talk about at, um, along with engineering and kayaking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. And bye, Becky. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Bye, guys. Okay.